Welcome to SelfDiscoveryMedia.com, where we discover the communities that are making a difference in the lives of others. Our self-discovery is something we are all making on our life's journey. Here you will find the people that will be your guidance, that will be your inspiration, that will be there for you in support on your journey of life. Do enjoy. Our next show is... Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of Their Story Matters, right here on selfdiscoverymedia.com. I'm your host, Sarah Troy, and my guest today is Charlie Sheldon. We have a lot to talk about today, and it's about storytelling, the stories that make us human. He is really stirred by the stories, uh, stories that inspire him to write as many books that we're going to be talking about today, but also, you know, the, the stories of people that are so courageous and people that have changed people and uh, he's just inspired by the writing and by bringing a story to life and you know he's um he's been a graduate studio uh, teacher in his life a commercial fisherman a house painter fisheries consultant treasury hunter then a planner and a construction manager he's done it all and each one of them is kind of a story in itself but today we're going to go and take this journey of why storytelling is so utterly important to him why why it's important to us because everybody's story matters and sometimes when you're even telling a fictional story it can be a story that relates to someone and makes them feel that's my story and storytelling has been around since fire was there around the fire of you know people sharing their day sharing their wonder sharing their dreams and storytelling is something that kind of keeps us connected keeps us alive and keeps uh, keeps things like possibilities of life and I think it's a, a big beautiful thing that we do in sharing stories today welcome to the show Charlie thanks I'm happy to be here storytelling I mean you've done a lot of things that would would not be necessarily connected with being an author or being a writer or, but being the kind of person you have been a fisherman and everything else there's always a story that you discover in the work that you do isn't there Yes, I think that's true. You do. You, you. I remember once a, a man once said he was taking a job. He was becoming the new my new boss, actually, at the Port of Seattle. And he made a very interesting remark. He said, every, every, every person here, every one of your lives is a novel. Mm. And that really um, spoke to me in that, in that it's true. Everyone has their own personal story yes. to tell. And the tracks you put down over a lifetime become the path you took, and that becomes your story. Some people at the end are happy with the path they took, and others are not. But that's the the story. Um, so yeah, stories I think are very important. Plus, I think personally that stories are the way people teach, the way you learn. You you by following a narrative, we seem to be wired somehow to follow and remember narrative arcs and then information can be attached to that narrative arc that can teach you that you can carry with you that you can use um so i think that's partly the reason that stories are so important is that originally before we had writing and yeah. the cloud and everything else uh, the only way you could you could transmit information generation to generation was through talk with through, through language but that was through stories and and i think uh, that was i think the way lessons were taught taught because i think that unlike asking people to memorize a list you know and some people are very good at that or memorize 85 separate things and some people are good at that something about the story arc embeds within you information that that somehow sticks if, if yeah. that makes sense yeah and so so i think that surely all these the, surely the stories that are told that are allegories that t teach lessons that that give messages that show you how to deal with situations you haven't encountered yet but you may in the future and the whole point about imagination i think it's just fundamental to who we who we are um e today for example in the modern world if you look at all the discussion lately with the way the media has gone with mm -hmm. the emphasis on social media, it's all about the narrative, mm -hmm. whichever group can 
have their narrative be the most powerful narrative in a room, that then becomes the truth. Right. And that's because the narrative is really the story. And if you can find a way to, to, to connect your ideology to a particular story that people will hear, you're basically um, training them in your ide ideology. Yeah, you're, sense. you're spinning the tail, right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it, you know, it, it's, I think it's universal and historical and, and uh, certainly I, as a kid, I mean, I loved reading, of course, and I loved discovering books of, but what I really liked was now and then one of my parents, friends or acquaintances or colleagues or just someone in town would be a storyteller. You know, he just start talking and you knew you better just sit there and listen because you're going to hear something great. And I. Sorry, we had a little interruption there, folks, we, just because we had okay. a little static, but please do continue. So what I think I was saying was that, that one reason I think stories are so important to people is that they are in fact the vehicle by which we learn things and make decisions and are influenced. Um, and, you know, it's not just the data, although the data leads you to a conclusion, it's the way the data is presented that mm -hmm. can either stick with you or not. And of course, a lot of people will argue well, the next step is that then becomes spin and that becomes you can, and there's some truth to that. Yeah. Actually, there's some truth to that. But the power of the story is, is, uh, is pretty enormous. And some, I think at times unrecognized in, in, in the way that it, I mean, look at all, look how big the film industry is. Look how big the TV and, industry and, is. And where did they all start from? A script. Right. Somebody's yeah. idea of a story. Right. right, then then got spun and woven into a web of a movie or TV or or, or music or a song, right? It's it's always about something that inspired someone. You know, the imagination, the wonderment, the what ifs, or the feelings, or the connections, or the observations that get right. put down on paper, then transcend into something else. And right. we love a story. Why do we go to the movies? Why do we watch TV? Why do we read books? Because we love a good story and we love to find ourselves in the story, the relatability. Right. That's all, all very true. The, the power of imagination. Mm -hmm. You can imagine something you, and, and, and in a way we almost create our own reality and yeah. we imagine something and then make something that makes that reality happen. <clears throat> and then that, so, you, so it's a, it's very complicated. I'm sure there are books and courses taught about this. And I'm just oh, yeah. trying to, you know, um, use it as a vehicle when you, when you're, when you're telling stories so that when you, obviously when you tell a story or write a novel or, or TV script or something like that, I mean, part of the, part of the, part of the goal is to just simply entertain, you know, yeah. from the, from the writer's point, at least from my, this writer's point of view, if, some of my readers will fall into the story and get lost in the story. That's the most success you can ask for. That's all you can really ask for. If they, if someone says at the end of reading a story, I didn't want it to end. Yes. I couldn't put it down. Yep. That's the highest accolade you can ask for. When's and, the and sequel? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's, that's a huge, that's a huge accolade. And so, uh, but then the other piece of it is that there's also in the best stories, I believe, are the ones that not only tell a good story arc, the, the narrative arc of, you know, inciting incident and then tension and then failure and then recovery and resolution, which mm -hmm. is basically all stories. Uh, but the, the best stories are the ones that also, I believe, provoke and inform so that at the end of the story, people will leave the story yeah. knowing more than they knew before mm -hmm. about something they didn't know about and maybe asking themselves, mm, could that be true? What yeah. about that? Let me try to explore that. That's, that's a, a great thing because that's how you in, incite people to learn. I also believe this is a little aside from that, but I also believe that we humans struggle with a couple of different traits, I guess you could say, and I, I'm sure you can go back into species survival and argue why each one helped us survive. But one trait, of course, is the trait to challenge 
the existing order and think of something new and break the mm -hmm. mold and do something different. But there's also a tremendous power, social power in holding to the, the taboos of the existing social dogma. Mm -hmm. You know, that you, you know, you learn, you, 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 we don't talk about whether the earth is flat or not. Everybody right. knows it's flat. And so th there's always this tension between the power of established dogma and you, you, you risk, you literally risk your life to step outside of it. And yet this urgent need of people to step outside of it. And so there's, there's always this, this tension and the best stories, I believe, enable people to question the dogma. <sighs> Uh -huh. without getting threatened. I think that's why science fiction became so possible. Because, oh, I because love science women fiction. <laughs> were, women would write about science fiction because they could write about different gender futures mm -hmm. in science fiction that they could never do in contemporary fiction. Right. Because contemporary fiction dogma doesn't allow that. Right. But in science fiction, you can. But also and, look at science fiction. You know, something you watched 30 years ago, and the technology that was used at that time, I mean, you can always date a TV show now by the, you right. know, the phones and the computers, but, you know, something that, you know, like Blade Runner and a few others, you look at it and you're like, it's so far out there. And now look at it. We can actually make limbs out of 3D machines now. You know, we can, we can do eye transplants. We can do things like that. And it was like, could never happen. And yet here we are. And what sparked what? Did the story sell it? Uh, storytelling and that visual of what is possible create someone to say, but I'm going to make it happen. You know, it's like, what comes first? Is it the storyteller that sparks the imagination or is it the imagination that, that sparks the storytelling? It really, it's a circle, isn't it? Because you see something and you're so in wonder of it and the impact that, that it has on you for so many people, it, it ignites that imagination. What if it's possible? Right. And that, of course, well, that's the, the challenge with science fiction. This is because <laughs> I'm wrestling with this right now. I've been trying to think about doing another series of stories set 100 years in the future. And it's very, you don't read much science fiction that is set in the near future. The reason being, it's so difficult to imagine what it's going to be like in 60 or 100 years. And if you're wrong, your, your story has no staying power, right? It just doesn't make sense. So many people just leap 300 years, at which point we have faster than light drive and we're going to different planets. And, you know, people could suspend their disbelief and accept that, but they may have, they may argue more with the idea of 60 years in the future, sending a probe to the island of, to the moon of Europa to see if there's life on it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So <clears throat> it's a, it's a tricky, tricky thing. The, the, the suspension of disbelief is, is you could argue the biggest in order to get you, the reader, to follow my story, you have to suspend your disbelief or believe yeah. that your reading is real enough that you can accept it, at least for right. the time of reading the story. Accept the story in, in the story. My brother is an author, and he recently wrote um, a youth genre one of um, the world is coming to an end. And uh, they have sent up in a spacecraft to another planet a whole load of children in stasis and they're being taught by their in stasis so when they get their 20 something years in right. time you know they'll be mature but they'll have all this knowledge but an asteroid hits them and there's only one child left and uh, an uncle who has designed a, a space warp thing that can go through time not have to you know do the time linear but you know go through time um they, it's they want to rescue her, her. and but it, they end up <clears throat> um, he goes into stasis. I can't remember quite happened. <clears throat> Excuse me. But he, um, she goes backwards and picks up these kids from 1999, just before the millennial and the end of the world. And then they go forward wow. into time and they go to this B planet. And uh, he's, all, he's kind of been an author since he was a child. You know, for him, writing was, is his passion. And, and he gets lost in it and the imagination. I've always loved reading his books for where he takes me. But it's also what I love afterwards, food for thought. You know, right. that may be far-fetched. It's like Star Trek, beam me up. We've never managed to do that. But, you know, it's just the message in there, Star Wars, you know, may the force be with you, you know. And right. it's those type of things have not only stayed with us, but they've become something we've seeked 
you know, we're looking for that force of energy, that force of enlightenment. We're looking, you know, for um, those things that give us a reason for living and, and hope for the future. And they give us all of that, that storytelling. So I love sci-fi. I'm a big sci-fi fan. <laughs> yeah, no, they, I, t t there's so many more genres today than there they used to admit to. Mm. You know, there's fantasy, there's yeah. young adult fantasy. So it's, it's much more complicated to, to find, your, um, find the genre you want. But I agree that, that, that that's a big, a big part of it. Of course, there's a whole other segment of literature, which is gritty reality and reflection on the past. And, and um, you know, it's, there's un, unlimited potential in terms of the type of stories people choose to tell. And that part, of the, part of the problem for authors today is that there are so many different ways to um, be heard and, and uh, understood that, that uh, there's so many different ways for people to be heard and understood that it's hard to be noticed. It's hard for anybody to, yeah. to see. You don't write to become Stephen King or J.K. Rowling. You know, it's, um, who was it, um, Kerry, that wrote 172 books before he even got published, you know, for the first time? I think it was him or somebody else uh, who ended up being a massive um, author afterwards. But, you know, it's, it's like the overnight sensational singer or performer, but they've been doing it 10 years. You know, so it's, you write, you share the stories because you're compelled to, because the story is within you and it has to come out. And right. it, it is a, a lot to do with the right energies and connection. Is that story at that time in front of the right person that sees it and knows how to market it? Right. And I think that's kind of one of the things. My brother does not know how to market himself. I kind of do the marketing for him. <laughs> uh, you know, he's 72 this month and it's like he hates social media. And, you know, he just wants to write and get the books out there. But, you know, it, he'll do the interviews, but all the other stuff, no. And that has actually become the thing now. If you're an author, you've got to be prepared to do this. You've got to be pre prepared to do the circuit. You've got to be prepared to do all your own promotion and advertising because the old publishing companies don't do it anymore. And so many people are self-publishing now, which there's nothing wrong with that. But no, it's, it doesn't end with just the writing of the book. It's very different too. And, and, and yeah, it, that's the, to me, the frustrating part of all this, you know, you, you, yeah. you write the, the process of creating the story is one form of reward or effort or work. And you need feedback from readers to justify the work you've done. But then the next step where, you know, if you want to make a living doing this, mm -hmm. and I know some authors who do, and it's, I admire them because it's, yeah. you have to be, an unbelievable self promoter in yes. every step of the way. And for some people, it's interesting. Some people love that. They thrive on yeah, that. It comes naturally for but them. But other people loathe it. And yes. I'm unfortunately one of those. I just, I was just at the uh, Pacific Northwest Booksellers Association trade show annual convention. And I was giving some books away. This is a bunch of all the bookstores of the Pacific Northwest. And they have a floor where publishers, presenting there are a few self-published authors there trying to give their books away and i admire them for what they're trying to do but i couldn't <laughs> i couldn't <laughs> do that you yeah. know so it's just it's just a it's a not it's i wouldn't this is not something i'd recommend to anybody unless you're driven to do it right and and yeah. i think nowadays it's even more complicated because when you go online and try to look at services to help you with this, yes. I mean, everybody's trying to pick your pocket yeah. with this and that, and, and they're almost all of them scams yeah. really. So it's, it's in a way it, in the end, it's, it's a little bit like a lottery. If you're lucky mm -hmm. and the right influencer sees your book or the right person seen with your book, then it might get legs and take off. Or if locally some local bookstores move a lot of your books, that helps too. Yeah. You know, they can do it that way. The, the sad thing is, you know, it, I, I like watching the, the talent shows of singing and things like this. And they will say to them, how come you haven't got a record deal? And it's like, 
it's got nothing to do with the talent. It's a lot to do with, you know, time and place and, and people you meet and, you know, people that say they're going to support you and they don't because somebody other with a different image comes along. There's just, we're saturated with talent. And we need that talent because it is our inspiration. It is our hope. It is um, a compass in many ways that guides us through, right? Stories guide us through. And it's, but it is also the management side of it. And you've got the managers that really want to see the story get out, that really want, this is a story that needs to be shared, needs to be told. Um, and then you've got the others like, oh, this is a good marketing thing, right? The hands are rubbing together and it's all, you know, money, money, money. And they, they, they do very little work for it. And it's, it's as an author, it's part of your, your job is to know how do I market this? Whom do I do it? And I think follow other authors that are doing well right. and ask them how they're doing it. Right. And okay, that may not be for you. That may not be for you, but I can do that. Excuse right. me, I'm, I'm really sorry to do this. Mm -hmm. Someone's knocking on the front oh, door. Go ahead and open and, the oh, door. And I've, I've got a guy coming to work on my stove when he was supposed to be here too, and he's here now. Go ahead. I'm going to go need to delay him or, or do something. Hold on, okay? I'll be, I'll be right here when you get back. <laughs> so I'll catch up again. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, this beautiful thing about doing on, you know, uh, doing a show like this is that in, it's organic and we get interrupted by things, right? And you never know who's going to knock at the door or the dog starts barking or the kid starts crying and it, it's life. And that is, that actually kind of brings me to a point that when a, an author is kind of immersed in their story and then, you know, mom's knocking on the door, where's dinner? <laughs> you know, And it's, there are, I don't know what your format is for writing. I mean, you know, I know my brother is, he's very kind of regimented on the way he writes, oh. you know, it's in the morning and then he goes for a walk, has lunch, comes oh. back in the afternoon. And, you know, he's very detailed in that. For me, it's like when I've got the time, you know, the fingers hit the computer keys and off I go, you know, uh, um, what's your style? How, you know, how, what kind of zone do you get into? That, that's an interesting question. I am not a, um, I am not, I don't write every day. <clears throat> In fact, I, I write a, I, I've been keeping, I keep kind of a journal, but mm -hmm. it's not really for fiction. It's just kind of reporting on stuff and this effort with the books and everything. Basically the way I've written and I've written nine novels now and they've wow. all been written pretty much the same way when I'm honest about it, which mm -hmm. is initially I needed a vehicle to do this. But what I do is when I'm writing something I do something every day and I write every day for anywhere between one and three hours. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, this is when I started the way I started and this shows how <laughs> this is interesting. The first novel I wrote was in 1988 and 89 and I was commuting to New York to the world trade center. And I started writing on the train going mm -hmm. to and from work longhand. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was a 30 minute train ride each way. And the miracle was that after four months, I had a novel written, mm -hmm. right? Just writing a little bit half an hour, because I'm basically lazy. If somebody said to me, write for two hours, I'd, I wouldn't do it because it'd be too overwhelming, right? Right. So that's what I did. Then when I moved to the Pacific Northwest, I intentionally found a place to live where I had to take a ferry to get to work. Mm -hmm. So I used the ferry as the vehicle to write, mm -hmm. right? And again, when I was writing a novel, I do it every day and it would take about three or four months to have the first draft and then three years to get it right. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the truth. It really, it was just a rough for first draft and then I'd work with it and move around it and let it steep for a while. And so that's been the pattern more recently. I, I thought I was a slave to being in motion to write stories, but then when I started writing the series, when I, I'd been to sea as a merchant sailor at an ancient age, but I'd done it. And when I came back, I was home for, you know, a couple months at a time and my wife was working and I just write at the house in the morning again, you know, and I just did it every day. Some days it'd be an hour, some days it'd be three hours, but every day. And the reason I do it every day is that whatever comes alive in the story mm -hmm. has a limited shelf life. For yes. me. And so if mm -hmm. I, I can't keep, I can't do it once a week, I mm -hmm. have to be in it every day. And then I'm in the flow. With it. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's the way it's been. And that's the way it's been. And, um, and I haven't actually written the last thing I wrote that was really new fiction was the second half of my third book, Totem, 
which I wrote in 2018 and 2019. It's almost been two years since I've really written a lot of fiction. I'm not troubled by that. If I start again, I know I'll, it'll yeah. produce a book, but, but um, that's my method. So it's to get the first draft out, do it every day, and then spend years cutting stuff away, moving things around, changing things. Um, and that's fun to do that. I don't write with outlines. I don't write outlines. Mm -hmm. I just write the story. I get a vague idea and do the story. And, and uh, that leaves room open for the fortuitous sort of miracle to happen, things happen that would never occur to me that my subconscious delivers and they, they make this, they're, they're what make the stories work actually, you know, as these things that jump into the story. Right. So. But you do do a certain amount of research on kind of the background of what, uh, well, what I, you're doing. That's, that's also interesting. And the first few books I did not, mm -hmm. um, but this last series, I spent almost three years doing research on the Pacific Northwest, which is where I live, of course, but on, I see human, by the way. human, human origins, the whole, mm. you know, I did two or three years research on everything from genetic history to Carl Jung and Joseph Campbell. I mean, there's a whole, a whole bunch of, but the difference was the first couple of books I wrote, I just wanted to write a book. Mm -hmm. It was a caper. It wasn't very serious, but in the later books, I wanted to deal with more weighty issues. Like what does it mean to be in a family? What is home really mean how did people become modern where did they really come from mm -hmm. and that took a lot of research and the interesting thing was in the earlier books when i started writing them until i had one or two real characters the book was wooden and i it was an effort to write it but once the characters came alive it was much more easy to do but this time when i did all these all this research when i actually sat down to write the first book strongheart which is the one I'm going to give away to whoever wants, mm -hmm. wants to read it at the end here, not, you know, give a link for a free ebook to read. But um, when I started writing that book, the characters were all there. It's hard yeah. to explain. They, they just, wanted they to jump just, in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, this is what I hear from authors all the time is they start off with an image of a character and then that character as the fingers hit the keyboard, take over and yeah. become a life of their own and and like they'll read back on a paragraph and go oh wow <laughs> i didn't know she could do that <laughs> or he could right, do that right. and and it's you know that was the joy of the writing is to see where the character could go instead of dictating it right allowing it right because then you're kind of in discovery at the same time as the reader is well there's a there's a there's a huge element of faith in doing something like this. Now, some people, um, some people, especially historical novel writers, I think, because they have to be accurate to a yes. known date, set of data, but some people do detailed outlines and then they write their novel based on the outline. Mm -hmm. To me, that's like writing the novel twice. Right. That's just me. So, I, I'm, I like to be a little less organized because that enables things to happen, right? But there, you know, there's always this exercise of faith, like, you know, is this going to work? Yeah. Am I doing this. And, and, uh, but you know, I've done this enough now to know, <laughs> know several things. One, I love writing novels. They're great. Mm. And I think they're pretty good. People like them. Two, I'm not at all successful at this from the marketing point of view, and I and I'm too old to change, and so to hell with it. And and three, in the end, in the end, the the the, the all those hours you put in, you know, making this thing happen, it's a very self-involved kind of thing mm -hmm. in a way. But I mean, it's it's a good way to spend time. I'd rather be doing this than playing the slot machines. Or right. Bar, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, so you do this thing because because at least I do this thing because and this is the the thing that when you tell a story and the person hearing the story feels wonder and sees it and has that experience, that's their experience of wonder. Yes. But the author who's creating mm. the story watching it happen yeah that's when i get my sense of wonder yeah. and i say to people now about these books in this series 
they say, well, where'd the story come from? Mm -hmm. And I say to them, I don't really know that mm -hmm. it just happened. I was yeah. just a bystander watching this happen. And that's yeah. not really true, but it's close to being Yeah, true. no, I think you go into a you know, kind of a channeling. You know, I'm not a book writer, I'm an article writer. And I do my own show, Sarah's View of Life, every week. And what I do is um, sometimes there's a topic I want to discuss, and I may kind of write the blog down first. And then kind of a, I read the blog and then I go off. And sometimes it's I just have one word and I put on the mic and just a perspective over that and off it goes. You know, that's my dialogue. And then I take it into a blog um, because it's always a blog, audio, video and everything else. And it's um, I just allow it to go where it needs to go to say right. what I need to right. say. I'm in the zone. I'm in the moment. I'm in the now. Um, you know, channeling whatever that energy is. And it's the only way I know how to do it. Because if I try and do it formatted, now you've got to do this. I've, you know, I've, I've gone to book things, yeah, but, yeah, you know, yeah, you've yeah, got yeah. to lay this out. You've got to do this. You've yeah. got to do that. And it's like, it doesn't work for me. No. Now, you know, I may yeah. have uh, a particular kind of agenda of what I want, but it, it's, I don't know what. I've gone back and listened to my own shows and go, really? <laughs> yeah. know, because once it's done for me once it's said or once it's written it's done i you know i can edit it yes but i can't go back and if you ask me well you know what did you say i did a speech at the other day at my my son's uh, um thanksgiving party for his staff and I can't remember what I said because I'm in the know. I'm channeling right what I feel at that right, moment. Right, right. And that's the way I write. And that's the way I kind of do my own personal shows. And you have to find what works for you. Right. Right. There is no right or wrong way, but there is a way that it, you know, when it comes into the editing, that it's readable. That, you know, I, I am a little bit more run on sentences because I'm a rhythmic writer and a rhythmic speaker and I want it to portray that way. I used to write for my brother's um, magazine, online magazine, and he would go in and edit it so much it was unrecognizable. And well, I said, look, you know, edit the grammar, edit the spelling, but leave it alone. And then when he got, I got responses, I go, I don't understand. How are you getting responses? Because I said, my rhythm is reaching people. Right, right. Uh, and it, it, this is the thing is you read a certain book and you know it's technically written very well, but then you can read another book where you get into the flow of it. You get into the rhythm of it. You are immersed into that story. You know, the pages are just flying by because you are down that river of that story. And I think it's know what kind of story you like to read, know what kind of story you want to write, but it's got to come from the heart, hasn't it? Well, it's hard to define what, how you choose the style you choose, I have to say. I mean, in mm -hmm. all the years I've done this, I mean, I learned late in the game, but I learned that one rule is if you're trying to write something for public consumption and you don't hire a third party editor to rip yeah. your work apart. You're, you're, you're an idiot because you have to do that. Yes. You blind, need that other perspective that sees it from a different point of view. Things yeah. You just don't know, especially yeah. if you tend, if I don't, because I don't write with an outline, mm -hmm. I find I, I often write myself from one scene to another and you don't need that stuff in the final mm -hmm. story. Right. Or I may be repetitive without yeah. realizing it. Okay. So I, but the other thing is style question. The one, one of the writers, so two writers really impressed me, <coughs> excuse me, or, and they're two different writers. One was Joseph Conrad, who wrote very involved, long, complicated sentences, but with great clarity. And, and he always admired me because it was a second language. He was a Polish seaman, who mm -hmm. was an author. And, and the other writer who I absolutely thought was one of the best is Elmore Leonard, who has a very spare style that there's a master of dialogue. He's a mm. master of dialogue. And I think his earlier books were better than the ones when he became very popular and kind of went into writing about Hollywood. But mm -hmm. when he was writing about Detroit or when he was writing Westerns, there's nobody better, mm -hmm. you know? And, and that was the style that told me you know, you don't need any more words than you need to tell the story. You know, mm -hmm. when you, you want, my theory is this, and I could be wrong, but my theory is you, the reader and intelligent, you're going to read the book, but what you're going to do is your mind is going to fill in the blanks mm. 
your way. And so I want to give you enough data so you can start the picture. Yes. But then you'll create your own picture. So, for example, in my characters, I don't over describe them. Mm-hmm. I don't describe them at all sometimes. Mm-hmm. I mean, I have one big character who's got a wandering eye and a great big jaw. Well, okay. So, you know, I could spend pages describing, you know, the jaw and the winds in the jaw yeah. and the creases in the jaw, but that's telling. Yes. That's, you know, you know what I mean? And there's a point at which if you can, if the reader gets enough to draw the picture, yeah, then they're going to be fine. Cause then you're in the world, you know, but if you're always stopping to describe what they should be seeing, if, if I'm the reader, I get ticked off. Yeah. I don't want to read that. You know what I mean? Yeah. You, you want them to be participants of the story with right. their own Im- imagination. You know, right. you've, you've laid that, that plan. What you're doing is inviting them to get onto the stage and be, be, be a, a part. And like, you know, if right. you're in a book club and everybody starts describing, you know, oh, I see this character doing this and doing, oh, I did that, but I saw it doing this and doing that. Yeah, yeah. And that's the beauty of it because that's where it shows all the different dimensions of that character as seen through our own individual eyes. Well, there's another whole discussion you can have about point of view, you know, how many points of view do you have? Like, for example, if you write a story in the first person, which many people default to, because it's sort of like writing a letter to somebody, the limitation in a first person point of view is you're restricted mm-hmm. in only what the narrator sees or experiences. So it's hard to have complicated storylines if it's all told from a single point of view. But then if yeah. you have several point of points of mm-hmm. view, which my, my stories do, the challenge there is you each character has to have their own arc in the story. Mm-hmm. Meaning each character has to have their own challenge and resolution for you, the reader, to care about what the character is right. doing. Otherwise, the character is just there to tell us, move the story along, and you're not going to be interested in that. No. So, for example, in my story Adrift, the second story in my series, the captain of the ship who has to abandon ship, his dilemma is he has a disabled son and he has to keep sailing to pay for the Right. care for his son and he and he hates being away from his son and he's torn up about this and then he loses the ship and he might lose his career right. so that's his that's his personal challenge but the whole his story life. is about this abandoned ship and what happens to everybody right and the other right. characters every character so this is the lesson i took from this was if i'm going to have a, a series of novels with six or eight points of view each chapter a different point of view but a linear timeline going along each character needs to have their own story arc yeah and then the story is then you hopefully you the reader are interested you know you go from myra to to travis to you know and, and you're yeah. you're, you're going to be interested because you you care about what myra's doing or you sort of care about what travis because you know what their arc is mm-hmm. and unfortunately a lot of times you'll read a story where there's one lead character and that's interesting but the other characters are really only there they're extras to move the story along yeah. and and <laughs> And, and to me, as a reader, I'm a fussy reader, and and if I'm reading a story and that's happening, I just lose interest. Yeah, I, I like I to. I lose interest and I don't read it. Right, no, no. Um, um, you know, again, my, my brother likes writing youth genre because, you know, you can really go right out there. And he always has a dog. Right. <laughs> always a dog. And the amount of times he's got... You know, having how do I save the dog? (laughs) (laughs) And it's like, you know, it's become that thing now that the dog or a child is in there, you know, and it's and it's always about the reluctant relationship with. And then it's it's the the drive to save the kid or save the dog. And you become so immersed in it. How is he going to do it? You know, and you want people on the edge of their seat, so to speak. You want them to because you know, you you know when you watch a show. And you know, oh, that, that one's going to get eliminated. That one's going to get eliminated. They're all the people that are going to get killed, right? And so you're, oh, not, you're not at all immersed into them at all, right? So uh, it, as you said, it's about the lead. And uh, you want, the lead can, hey, it's a hard thing to carry the whole time. It also can be very monotonous and boring. You know, you want the characters, everyone else around them. Why are they leading them? You know, why are they following what is it about this leader that makes everybody else want to follow? Or do they think they'll make a better leader? We like complexity because that complexity in many ways unravels the complexity in our own lives. 
yeah that that's true that's 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 certainly true i mean in the end you know you when you when you do a novel and i did a series of you know this they're set in the pacific northwest they're set in the olympic peninsula in the gulf of alaska they're set in the present day or sometime in the ancient ancient past which is either a dream or memory or real time travel you don't know and the reader decides and mm-hmm. it's interesting some readers think it's a dream other readers think oh no that was time travel and that's mm-hmm. intentionally vague because again the reader decides right yes. and so and you know there's a lot of there's a coming of age in it and there's mystery and the power of old legends and ancient history well many people they like detective stories they like romance stories right yeah. they like cozy mysteries they're not going to be interested in this okay that's fine you can't interest everybody right. but hopefully for those people who have a yen for stories like this set in the northwest and kind of set out in the wilderness mm-hmm. you want to be able to have something that's as true as it can be so when they read it they feel like they've been there i mean that's the yeah. to me and of course i've spent a lot of time a lot of time hiking in the olympic national park so i feel confident in describing mm. what it's like there i love yeah. it there but but i mean i'm anal enough to know and i write my stories i have even had maps in these books and people who are hikers are going to read these stories and if i get a fact wrong right no you know yeah. you, know, you know that creek doesn't look like that in that place <laughs> <laughs> i know yes so, yeah so yeah my, my brother goes um, and he's right here he will go and research the area if he's picking a particular area, but right. now he's learned to fictitious area based on an area you might right. know, right? <laughs> because, yeah, right. it can get like right. that. Um, you know, it kind of reminds me of a, a story I did because this podcasting very of is for sharing stories. And this was actually of a fisherman who um, the, everybody was asleep and he, the wind had stopped picking up. So he went out to batten things down and he ended up going overboard. And it was his boots that kept him alive. He wow. took off the boots and he literally put them under the arms and they floated right. him. Right. And when everybody woke up, he's like, where is he? Right. And, and uh, they didn't know how long ago he fell over because everybody had been asleep and it was the backtracking and, and he was treading water for hours and it was everything going through his mind. Oh, and, you know, I'm never going to see this again. I'm never going to do that. I'm never going to do this. And the whole time, just simply these boots keep him alive. And I said, well, the boot company must have really endorsed you. No, nope, didn't want anything to do with it. And I thought, God, how short-sighted. <laughs> you know, these boots right. saved this guy's life. But it was the entire kind of, I mean, he, when, when they picked him up, he was, you know, obviously freezing and, you know, um, hypothermia and things like this. But there's a picture of him smiling. I'm, I'm alive. I'm alive. And it's like... Wow. You, you can't, if you wrote that in a novel, be, oh, yeah, Boots keeping him alive, right. And, but, you know, it, very often that fiction is so relatable to life, you don't know. I mean, how do you know that that isn't a real story somewhere? Well, I, I know from having been fishing that you could do that. I mean, that's doable. But, you know, the, the big, the, the kind of boots that fishermen wear are big rubber boots that come up to the upper calf. Mm-hmm. And they have quite a lot of volume in them because they got to be loose so your oil skins can get down in them and stuff. So yeah, if you turn them upside down, they trap quite a bit of air in each boot, each boot, and so it would help you stay afloat. Yeah. absolutely. And if you could hold them under your arm, yeah. you wouldn't lose the air. You're never going to lose the air as long mm. as they're pointing straight mm. down. So I, I get it. It's completely reasonable. yeah. Because you're the fisherman, you understand. Are other people like boots, no, <laughs> in no, the boots, no. <laughs> yeah, and um, but. You know, it's like you, you hear a story like that and, you know, as, as a layman, somebody who's never gone fishing, it's like, uh, you know, that's a miracle. And it is a miracle that, he, that you know, he managed to live for sure. But it's, um, we like to hear those kind of, we'd love to hear people going through adversity, struggle, challenges, discovery of self, um, because in, and then coming out, you know, thriving from it, because in that journey, it becomes a journey of invitation and courage to ourselves. Well, you know, if this carrot can do it, can't I find that within myself? Do well, I have that whole, kind of courage? There's a whole, I mean, I, I, when I was doing all my research, I mean, there's a whole series of thinking which Carl Jung got into and then Joseph Campbell got into on about myths and so on about the arc of a life and the arc of a story and how they're quite similar and it's sort of common to all 
people in the collective unconscious and the sense of, and so part of what I wrestle with and I'm interested in wrestling with is the power of old legends and mm -hmm. can there be truth in those legends and, and some concern on my part about uh, people thinking because we have all of these, back to our earlier discussion, because we have all of these technological gimmicks that we didn't have a hundred years ago, that somehow we've changed as, as, as a human beings from what we were when we were hunter gatherers, but actually behaviorally and psychologically, we haven't changed much at all. And so the very same passions that drove us, you know, 10,000 years ago are still driving us, but we think we're not being driven by them because we have all these gadgets, but yeah. <laughs> that ain't true. And so there's this whole, and, one of the, and from a writer's point of view, here's an interesting dilemma. From a writer's point of view, recognizing that today technology changes so quickly, especially yeah. with telephones and stuff, mm. what you, you got to be careful. I intentionally, when I wrote my series, this series, I intentionally placed people either out in the national park or at sea on boats, because that's about as far as you can get from the latest mm -hmm. cell phone gizmo and so on. So that means that hopefully the story has a more timeless quality to it. It's not, I wrote another novel 15 or 20 years ago about a hijacked container ship. And it was based on a thing, it was based on something around GPS technology at the time, mm -hmm. which has now changed. Right. So the novel doesn't work anymore. No. Technology has changed. Do, okay. Do you, do you remember the, the wonderful movie, Robin Williams' movie, Centennial Man? I did not see that. I oh, it, I mean, it's one of his best, but he, he, he starts off of being an organic robot, oh, right? Okay. And, uh, but there's a flaw in him. And the flaw in him is that he has a conscience. Yeah. And of course, they wanted to eliminate him and somebody else wanted to save him. And it's him over 200 years. And, you know, in 200 years in the future, he actually has invented parts that can replace you know, different organs, different limbs, different this and that from people. And so that it can merge with them, you know, if something goes wrong, they can replace it. So people become part robotic and part human. But the whole thing that he wanted the entire 200 years is to be looked at as human. Yeah, right, right. That's right. right. Yeah. It's a beautiful movie. I do recommend it because, you know, it, he, and the data from Star Trek. Yeah. Right. Same thing, same you thing. know, it's just wanted to be, you know, and why is it is because we don't realize what a gift it is to be human. We don't realize um, how miraculous we are, how extraordinary we are until we're put into a situation. Right. And, you know, this is why we're driven by the stories of struggle and triumph, because, you know, you come up, oh, you know, you read the book. Oh, I'm so glad they got out of that. And it's like, could I, could I? Right. And, and it's how many people even having, you know, read a book and got into a situation. How did you know that I read it in a book? <laughs> you don't know the seeds that you're planting there, right? And that's, no. that's the beauty of storytelling. That's the wonder of storytelling. Um, it will never end. It may transform in different ways. You know, people, oh, books are passe. No, they're not. In fact, there's more books out there now because of, you know, people are doing their own thing. And, and of course, a lot of self-help books. But we still, you know, we, people may be listening by audio now instead of picking up. I still love a hard copy. Um, but, you know, right. it, people are listening to it while they're driving or jogging or cooking or, you know, um, reading it on their Kindles or whatever. It really doesn't matter. It's just allow yourself to get immersed into a story that takes you out of your own realm, puts you somewhere else. And it enlightens you, it excites you, it educates you, it, um, it liberates you. And at the end of it, you know, when I didn't want to put it down, that's how, you know, when if, if I have a book that, I, that I'm still lingering in the story, I'm still referring to the story, uh, then I know that was a book that had a huge impact on me. Yep, yep. Well, that's what, from an author's point of view, that's what you hope for. Yeah. You hope that the reader... I mean, in, in a sense, if you give a book to 10 people, if three of them like the book, you're like a 300 hitter in baseball. You're doing really well. Right. I mean, all, we authors want everybody to like. Yes. They don't. And, and uh, 
you just have to live with that you know i mean um some of us like as i said earlier some like romance some like mm. historical novels some like science fiction some people like everything some people specialize in things i i i call my stories are really um they're they're fiction with a little magic realism in them mm. you know it's 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 not science fiction it's not fantasy but there's a couple little twisted things in it you know that that hopefully are realistic you know, that's what you, that's what you, because again, you, the reader yeah. have to, if you, if, if you run into something you can't accept, you, you lose, you're lost, yeah. you're lost in the story. Well, know? I know that, you know, if I'm a chapter or two in and, and, and I'm yawning, you know, oh, yeah. I haven't connected, you know, this book is not for me. And right. I, I kind of, you know, when I go into a bookstore, or when I come across a book, I let the book speak to me. You've got to read me. <laughs> it jumps right. out, right? Uh, I'm one of these people, I can't do a chapter a night. I get in, leave me alone. Don't talk to me. I'm reading yep. a book. And I just get, in, you know, immersed into it. And I love, you know, getting immersed into that story. Because if I can't see me in the story, and I don't mean Sarah, right. I mean my no, alter no. ego or anything else. If I can't see, like, if I can't be one of those characters, I can't be engaged, right? right. And no, even yeah, if it's yeah. an historical book, it's always like, but could I have? Am I that kind of person? You know, right. could I become that kind of person? You want to have that relativity of connection there that, you know, I see it, I feel it, I hear it, I connect with it, right? right. Well, that's the goal. That's Yeah, the yeah. Yes. And, you know, much like the way you're doing your thing is, you know, with my podcast thing, and I don't pay for big advertising, I do all the social media, a great deal of it is referring now, I have many people who share the shows across the way, I've been yep. doing it Perfect. for over nine years, and, and it's like, you know, I've got people saying, do you have these many followers, I won't come on your show, unless you do, and I said, if the show hits one person, pivots one person, excites one person, liberates one person, I've done my job. If it does more, fantastic. But just like you don't know who reads the books unless they reach out to you, I don't very often know who's listening unless they reach out to us and comment. But that's, you know, you put it out there in trust, right? And well, just I've, hope that people like the baby. <laughs> I've, I've been trying to do podcasts. I've done about 20 podcasts, I think. And some are very little and some are bigger. And I don't, honestly, I don't know. But what I do know is, there may be one, two, five, ten mm -hmm. people who hear the podcast who otherwise never know right. about these stories or yes. me or anything. And so right. it's worth it, you know. It is. Now, no, look at the numbers. Just look at, you know, the, the energy that you're putting out there. And those that are on that frequency, we will pick it up. Right. Well, and I, I mean, I have a look at my web page. You know, there's pros and cons to web pages. I've been doing it for several years, but it's really more had been more just a place to record stuff I like mm -hmm. than anything else. I'm trying to link it to these books a little bit. And it, the trouble with the web page is you have to keep feeding it. Yeah. You know, and let alone run a podcast where you have to have a show every. I mean, I don't know how you guys do it. I do um, <laughs> approximately four shows a week and, oh, um, wow. and they're video and the audio and they're on 14 audio platforms and everything else. It's a full-time oh job for me. It is, yeah, you know. Yeah, but um, good for you. That's great. It's a, you know, not necessarily lucrative, but it is passionate, you know. Yeah, and nice. it's and it just, you know, um, you've stepped into something that's passionate for you, as you said. It's not about the money, about getting rich. It's not about the fame and the glory. It's about the art of the storytelling. It's about sharing a story that will illuminate someone else that will intrigue someone else and right. you know when you find that calling whether it be an author a musician you know a, whatever it is an actor or anything that it, that inspires other people it's a calling that um and that's why i love inter interviewing musicians because it doesn't matter if they're broke or rich they have to play the music you right, know and that right. but it's so compelling and like when you become that author and for me it's podcasting because i've done over two thousand of them now um you just i'm addicted to sharing the stories right i'm addicted right. to to people hearing all the you know ordinary people doing extraordinary things and that you too could do it you know where's your calling where's your passion it's lying inside you you're dying to get out and you know maybe that one show will be something that will switch it on and you you can't help but do you know what you're compelled to do and just do it right just do it you know i 
it's this is really helpful for me because I'm realizing in the stories that that I've done, it's for these last three anyway, you could say they're coming of age stories because the the main character is this ornery 13 year old girl who finds her power in an unbelievable way. But there are also a number of other teenagers who find their power. And it's really about, to me, it's really about in the life. Mm. How do you find your power, whatever that yes. power is? What is it? Now, of course, you have to put food on the table. And for many <laughs> millions of people, this isn't a choice they can make. It's just the way it is. And it's no. horrible and it, it's tough and you make the best of it. Yeah. And I, what I try to do is write about people who are otherwise perfectly normal people who end up in an extraordinary situ- circumstance and either they discover something or they don't, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. because in the end, as I said at the very beginning, if your life's a novel, the tracks you put down, the decisions you make day to day become the life you end up living. And, and I don't know about you, but I figured out a while ago that the person to be most frightened of is yourself out yes. in the future, looking back at you saying, did you really want to do this right now? Don't you know what that's going to do? <laughs> and, and I'm telling you, that's, that's what I'm afraid of most is me 10 years from now saying, you idiot, you should have gone that way instead of yeah. this way. Um, I'm always person, I, I'm, you know, like some things get presented to me and it's like I'm, I was involved in an electric motor technology that was brand new, very quantum. I had no understanding of how the thing worked. I just knew that it had to be made. And we got caught up in 2008 and we got caught up with people stealing it and, you know, this, that, and I became bankrupt living out of the car. And then it was, you know, kind of crash and burn and having to start all over again. And I wrote an article on, on depression and somebody saw that and then went to my site and saw what I was doing and said, oh, I think you should join my podcast. You'll be a good podcaster. Wow. And I went, what's that? <laughs> You didn't know what a podcast was. I did 13 months live with them, which was a fantastic training ground. And then um, as of June this year, I've eight years been doing my own. And even when I look at the way I started off, I was still kind of navigating in the dark, right? And 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 uh, as you get better at it, you you know, you, everything else gets better at it. And am I big and flashy? No, I'm a plotter, I'm solid. And, uh, and I stand by what I put out and I couldn't do anything else now. You know, right. this is it. This is it. I, I finally found all the, all those years of everything else that I did um, right. kind of be, became the, the training ground for what I'm doing now. Right. So don't, as, as we look in the books and the stories, why do we, we're looking for that courage. We're looking almost for that permission. Right. And it's like if that wonderment is in you, if you're willing to explore, willing to take the adventure of life, don't dictate, allow and just go on the journey and see where it takes you, because you'll never know what you're going to discover on the other end of it. I think that's I think that's true. I'm hesitating because I I still think that. You know, for the cohort of people who are so busy just trying to pay the rent and survive, you know, it's fine and good to talk about, well, write your passion, your novel in the evening when you've done your work, but I'm sorry, that's just not realistic for people who are, I mean, when I spent five years working, you know, as a merchant sailor on ships and I thought I could write on ships and there's no time, but you're working all the time. Mm -hmm. But most of the, you know, that's late, that's manual labor. It pays pretty well, but you're never home. Okay. It's hard work. Mm -hmm. And yeah, if you can write a book while you're at sea, more power to you. Ah, but, but the, the story did is, get written. It just did, got it written got, later. It got know? written in between. Yeah. But I think but I'm, what I'm saying is that 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 the the people who have to work for a living, meaning, you know, they're just laborers, they they may not have a college education, they're they're not um they don't get four weeks of paid vacation a year to do other things, right? They're just trying to survive. Um there are some writers who write about that life mm-hmm. pretty well, but it's hard to do. But I think there's a little bit of a danger in, I'm, I'm, I get cautious with saying to people, you just follow your dream because life will be good. I think in some cases it's possible, it's necessary to make your dream out of what your circumstances are that you have to face every day because, because that's until that changes, you know what I mean? So it's a, 
it's difficult. I think the courage, the, but your point about courage is really powerful that whether you're, you know, don't have to work or whether you're working 20 hours, you know, a day, those people who choose to try to nurture their interests and follow their interests and find their power, whatever that power is, whether it's writing or singing or working or caring for people, those they're going to feel happy because they've tried to develop mm -hmm. that power. Other people who, for one reason or other, won't go that way, I think, have a much more difficult time because they know somewhere that it slipped them by somehow. So it's, and, it's, and, and I don't yeah. think we're ever too old. I mean, I started this at <laughs> 57, not. right? And I'm 67 now. So, you know, and, and it's and the, the oldest person I've interviewed was 89 and she had her own TV show, you know. And, you know, it, it, the thing is, is don't don't put limitations on your on yourself. Exactly. You know, maybe you can't do it right now. Maybe it's something that is fermenting or seeding. And that will come out later and maybe you're not meant to be the author maybe it's something else but as you said find some passion in the work you do and if yep. the work is is killing you you know go and yep. find something that you can take that passion in, in, a, in a different role i think one of the reasons why people just suck it up and suffer in the job just to put the food on the table is because they're living in their limitations they're, they're living in a, in a thing of well this is my lot in life and, you know, and I think that if we could see that we are so much more, we're capable of being so much more. And very often when you do read a book or you see a story of inspiration, it's like that question to yourself, well, could I, could I, have I sold myself short? And, you know, everybody's capable of pivoting or changing uh, and doing something if, if they see the possibilities. And very often we don't see the possibilities because we've put the low expectations on right, ourselves right, right. That's well that's back to the back to the point we made or i made earlier about some people break out of the box yeah but the power of the dogma if you bought if you buy into yeah. or accept the dogma that your life can't change and you've got to you to live this life it's very hard to break out of that because it's very hard to even think about breaking out of that because the power of groupthink is so strong yeah and so um Life is, as I say, life is difficult. Life is complicated. You do the best that you can. I feel very fortunate that I've been able to have enough discipline, even in a ferry ride, to be able yeah. to tell stories. It's been fun. It's a way to make use of some of the different things that I've done. Um, but it's it's not very remunerative. No. But, but that's okay. It, it it's it's me, in, enriching keeps me out of trouble and yeah. that's important too but, but you know see it's enriching to you to do it and then right. it's enriching for someone to read it and and it's a story that will live long after you right and well, that's very, th that's the beauty of storytelling it it doesn't have to have a time frame well when i started my series it wasn't going to be a series it was going to be one book but then i ended up doing another book and then I did a third book to finish the series. And it was tough to, you know, I figured mm. if you start a series, you better finish it. But now it's, I've completed it. It's the best I can do, mm -hmm. right? It's the best I can do. People either like it or they won't like it. Right, yeah. You know, I can't do anything about that. that but it's not like I'm caught with writer's block yeah. trying to finish the last chapter. Mm -hmm. And I'm very relieved with that and happy with that. And, you know, again, it was only through support of some of my friends and my wife, especially, and just keeping encouraging me to say, keep going. Because it took 12 years to do this, mm -hmm. you know, but I'm, I think I've got it done and I'm happy with it. And that, you know, achievement in itself is just, it's something that's so big, you know, and, you know, we, we are all capable of some form of achievement. It doesn't have to be writing a book, you know, I mean, how many people have got a gift inside of them that they don't realize is a gift that's just waiting to come out. And it, and it is up to us in our own self-discovery. And if we don't sell ourselves short and we don't have to take the leaps and the bounds, you know, some of us do that and some of us lad in mud, you know, and we have to get out of that mud. Some of it, it's just maybe inch by inch. But I think one of the sad things in humanity is when you give in to stagnancy and complacency, right. Yeah, and go, uh, there isn't anything more out there. There's always something more out there if you're willing to see it. You know, ignite the, the wonderment in you and the sense of adventure in you, because then that opens up to the possibilities. Well, what if it's possible? Because 
I've done some bizarre things in my life, in my careers and, and journeys I've taken, because it's like, well, I don't know, let's just give it a try. And some of it's worked and some of it hasn't. But each one of them has been a lesson. And each one of them has shown me I can do so much more than I thought I could do. That's great. Right. And so it's not about the achievement of each one of them. It's about that I had the courage to try. Exactly. Exactly. Right. And it may have taken you 12 years, but you put out many books, but these three books in particular. And that's what's important. You put right. your heart and soul into it. You put all of your experience into it. You know, put your intent into it. And now somebody reading that is going to feel, A, if they don't know anything about the sea, they're going to learn a great deal from it. But the characters, they're going to immerse themselves into them. They're going to come away afterwards with some knowledge, some perspective, and maybe even a perspective over themselves that they never had before. And that is the art of storytelling. Absolutely. That's, that's, that's a good, act, good description of it. Absolutely right. How do people get the books from you? Where do the people get the books from you? And how do they follow you? Uh, stop. I'm sorry. They're back. They're back. And, okay. Yeah. Cool. So let me. Okay. So I said, folks, you never know what's going to happen in the background when you're going to be doing things. So how do people get hold of you and the books, love? Okay. My, my, I call this the Strong Heart series. There are three books, Strong Heart, Adrift, and Totem. They're published by a company called Iron Twine Press. They're available through any independent bookstore. The bookstore may be carrying it if you're in the Pacific Northwest. If not, you could just ask for it and they'll order it for you. And I like people to buy through bookstores. Mm -hmm. They're available as well through Amazon. There are Kindle versions or ebook versions available through Amazon. Strongheart the first novel is also available as an audio book through Amazon narrated by an actress friend of my wife's. Mm. Uh, so they're available that you can, um, you can just Google my name, Charlie Sheldon, and you'll get information about the books up on the web. I think my yeah. web page, my web page is Charlie Sheldon com. That's with an I E Charlie Sheldon number two.com and there there are links to the books there and a little bit of discussion about the books and reviews and so on so that's basically it they're basically literary fiction i guess you could call it with some magic realism adventure coming of age strong women women as heroes finding their power and uh <laughs> mostly centered around this ornery 13 year old girl who fetches up on the door of a grandfather who never knew he had a granddaughter and he's stuck with her. He takes her on a backpacking trip and a great adventure happens. Wonderful. And, and that's how it, how it goes. And it, it started as one book, but became three. And they're now finished. And they, they're independent. You can read them independently. It makes mm -hmm. sense to read them in order, of course. But they can be read either any way you want. Um, but they tell one grand story about the northwest corner of Washington State and ancient, ancient truth. Wonderful. And the Northwest is just wonderful. I love it. I live across the water from there in Victoria right. and um, have spent many time there. I actually wanted to move to Seattle at one point, but that didn't happen. But um... oh, you didn't miss anything. You didn't miss anything. <laughs> so I'm going to spell your name for people who are just listening. Charlie, C-H-A-R-L-I-E and Sheldon, S-H-E-L-D-O-N. Right. And it's uh, Charlie Sheldon 2. Dot com and okay. of course they can put your name on amazon but you encourage people to uh, order from their local bookstores as well right wonderful right. um you know the storytelling will never stop it may change formation um why is the movie industry so big why is the tv industry so big and you know um, now independent movie areas it's because we love a story we love to find ourselves in the story. We, you know, we like to even find the encouragement from a story. And, but it all starts from the written word. So whether you're seeing something on screen or not, somebody wrote that script. Right. And you know, when we read you know, the book from maybe where that script came from, you know, it's, um, there's always something to be discovered about ourselves in a good book. And I encourage people to read a good book, uh, even if it's like, well, you know, I don't see myself in that. Ooh. Take the journey. Take the journey. You're going to be afterwards. I go, mm hmm, what an if. You're right. So it's a wondrous place to be to dive into a book and go on that journey. It really is. 
snuggled up. We're in the winter, folks, snuggled up in front of the fire or under the blankets, you know, with a good cup of something and a glass of wine and just read a good book. And that's really what's important because stories do matter. They do. Thanks so much, Charlie. It's been great having you here. Thanks a lot. It's been my pleasure. Remember, folks, pick up a book and read. Take the adventure with Charlie's stories here. You don't know what you're going to discover about yourself or maybe somebody else you know, or just even about the Northwest that you never knew. It's all about wonderment. And when you step into wonderment, you really are stepping into a beautiful world. Until next time, bye for now. We hope that you enjoyed the show. You will hear many, many shows here on selfdiscoverymedia.com. We have new shows for you out every week. Just find them on our podcast or, or what's new. If you feel that you have something to share that makes a difference in the lives of others, or you too feel that you could be a host, please contact me at info at selfdiscoverymedia.com and we will be glad to speak with you. Have a wonderful day.